and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are we are not quite done with Veil of the Void, but we but we are at the beginning of the end of our look at the classes. So it's been it's certainly been fun. Um when we I don't think we've come across a bad class so far. No, they're all actually really good to put together. Um and it's very clear with the sort of mix and match ideals how expertise is and how you can pull non-exclusive skills from other classes into your class uh, are really going to encourage experimentation in this system. Mm -hmm. And you know I appreciate a multi-classing system that isn't a minefield. <laughs> I don't think there are any trap choices so far, so... No? Now... For the last, for our last class entry, this is one that's so big that we're going to have to split it in two. Because this week we're talking about the Thalmatech. And in talking about the Thalmatech, that also includes talk going into the spell trees that, are, that the Thalmatech has access to. We've dipped into this with certain classes, but the Thalmatech has the most out of all of them. So there is absolutely no fucking way we can do this in one night. Yep. The Thalmatech has, well, it has access to the Arcane Tree. But the Arcane Tree should be more accurately called the Arcane Trees. Yeah. Because... It's, it's the four Hellenistic elements, people. It's, it, it is air of fire, water... And then, of course, there's superlatives, which are gigantic, mm. looks like. And when the world needed him most, he vanished. Oh, come on. I knew I you were going to make that joke. <laughs> I knew you were going to make that joke. <laughs> That's because you're learning. No, I knew you were going to make that joke before I finished talking about the spells. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm learning, it's that I've already learned. Yeah. <laughs> as, I've as I've told other people, the problem is that the problem is that Zan and I are similar people. <laughs> After all, how could I bane him so effectively if I didn't already know some things about him? <laughs> It's like two sides of the same coin. Or maybe Ryuki's mirror universe. No, we have better writing. I know, that's why it's our board take on Ryuki! <laughs> <laughs> but... The, Th the Thaumatech could be the closest thing to a wizard or an elementalist or, e or even the good old-fashioned... A blaster caster or an or an evocation focused um wi wizard or um sorcerer i'd say sorcerer more than a more than anything else than wizard but it's as good a time as any to go into why we why we come off at times like we have a hate boner for spell casters mm -hmm. and to be perfectly clear while it can seem like we have a hate boner for spellcasters, that's not 100% accurate. What we don't like are games whose designers have a, um, have a fanboy fixation on casters and want to make them almost Mary Sue-ish. Yeah. I think Tanner said it best when we when we were discussing casters for Heavens and Heresies in that they get more game out of the game. Not just with having a whole magic system that has that is several pages long all to themselves, 
but also with some of the things that they can do with, say, skills or even magic adjacent things. Yeah. The, the, the whole thing was every class should be able to interact with your game world and the sandbox they're in equally. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, sh- they should all feel like they have a stake. But in a lot of systems where we criticize casters, it's because the stake that the the caster classes have is much higher than the stake of the non-caster classes, whether those are crafting classes, martial classes, social classes, anything in between is irrelevant. Um, the casters tend to have the most interaction in those systems that we do criticize. But when we did the review for Heavens and Heresies, we saw every caster as a fantastic addition, especially since, as uh, Tanner so succinctly put it, Every class is supposed to inherently change the way that the game is going to be played. Um, so when we've come into Veil of the Void, we've been seeing the same thing. None of the classes are have more interaction with the game world than any other. And all of their interactions that they have are somewhat unique. I mean, there are some uh, skills that I guess, get the same effect in a different flavor, like those reputational skills that make the soldier uh, able to get free room and board with mercenaries and, and other fighters of that nature. But that's that's still a narrative hook that's really cool. So even then, his interaction with the game world on a roleplay level is going to differ than, say, a, a combat medic. I think the key, th- I think the key thing is... With both, with both, with both heavens and heresies, and with veil of the void, we have not encountered what could be considered a basic class, or the or a or a um, for lack of a better term, a simple class. Because mm-hmm. we've talked about how, say, fighters have the reputation of Babby's first class, largely because the pool of actions that they have access to is the small is the smallest compared to their contemporaries. Mm-hmm. Um it's can if you'll forgive me for use for referencing Fantasy Star Online, it's the reason why the easiest class to get into for first timer was was the Who cast. Not, no, not the Who cast, the um actually actually yeah what yeah it was the Who cast. Yeah, Cast Hunter was very basic. Because um, all you had to do was hack and heal, and you were immune to the majority of status effects except short. Yep, because casts are not physical. They're robots. And... To be fi- Whereas, whereas, um... The, the, um, arc and in those kind of setups there's the there's the implication of having the caster be the advanced or the system mastery class which is a paradigm that I'm gl- I'm glad to see starting to find its way out of the conversation mm-hmm. in ta- in I'm- tabletop development this idea that there's a that there's a beginner class and a system mastery class is something that I think needed to go the way of the dodo. Now, I will admit that even in games where classes are all equivalent, such as Veil of the Void or Heavens and Heresies, um, there are going to be classes that are more straightforward to play. Field maybe. Knight. I mean, no, I don't even think the Field Knight could be, like, if you take just the just the kit that the Field Knight has and aren't going to dabble around, sure. But even then, the, the uh, specializations are going to just vastly change that. Um, it may have a slightly lower skill floor, but its skill ceiling is at the same place as all other classes' skill ceiling, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. Yeah. So, with that in mind, looking at this this Thaumatech, um, 
just with the amount of content it has, may, some people might assume, oh, this is this is the system mastery class. But, I mean, I could argue that um, the naturalist is a system mastery class. Mm -hmm. Not only because their, their tree is the only tree that no spells can be taken from outside of being a naturalist, but also with some of the really interesting avatar aspect stuff they can do um but then of course i i go over to the architect or maybe the necromancer or hell the smuggler uh, there's there's no way to say which one is the true quote system mastery class mm -hmm. so i'm really looking forward to the thaumatech yeah. here and I will admit that part of that, if you want to blame any one person for me having, for me having a hate boner for, for for um caster characters, there is one name that you can blame, and there is the controversy with one book that you can also blame. Now the name is Monty Cook, and while he's lightened up in recent years, I still remember the days when he when his attitude was, give the caster more spells. But the book is already is already is already sixty percent spells. More spells. Did I stutter? <laughs> and of course, I know I bring is I know I bring the supplement up to death, but I can't. But I, but the discourse surrounding the Book of Nine Swords was a foundational element for how I look at the game design discourse. Mm. Because because uh, because you had you had a lot of people who would play casters who would argue that that book was dipping into caster territory and turning fighters into casters. And as I've pointed out plenty of times in the past, it's horribly ironic that the dipping into caster territory was an argument used when there are so so many spells back then and even some now that are dip that are dip they're dipping into or st or outright stepping on the ball sack of other classes. Yeah. Knock is all is always going to be my favorite example of that kind of thing. Hmm. And while so while sometimes a clever GM might might put a house rule on, on something like knock by saying it only works on magic locks, you know, so that the rogue in the party actually has something to do. Yeah, even then, that's a stopgap. That's, that's not a fix. Yeah, it's a bandage. And the pro the problem is when you get, the reason why I did that some um, pages of spells experiment all those years ago is. When you have a book that is so dedicated to giving that many options to one archetype, there's only so many pages you you have in a book, and more for one means let me more for one means less on everybody else's plate. Yep, the there is a especially when that is a system that only some things can access. Not only have you taken up space for other ideas you could explore to give those non-caster classes access to, but you've created a huge dedicated chunk of material that is only uh, accessible to an elite few with no real uh, solution other than dip into a caster class. Yeah, and um, if I have to use video game examples of this kind of thing, that discrepancy isn't as present as it used to be. Some may some may argue this is because of MMO design, but if I'm being honest, if that if if that's what it took, I will I will take it. But consider consider um consider the likes of let's use let's use one of my favorite chestnuts, Heroes of Might and Magic Two. Oh God. Where there's far more magic than there is might, and it's a race to see who can get the genie first. Yeah. 
or as much as much as I as much as I like Final Fantasy just that, just as a franchise, it would be hard for it'd be hard pressed to deny the fact that late game in a lot of the classics, it really does become the caster game. Um mm. <sighs> with one sure with two, not as much because two, literally everybody's a caster. Two's got too many moving parts, so that's an exception. And then in three, you've got the job system, and the jobs were pretty well implemented to be all viable even at end game. Um, four. No, I can't say it about four. I'm sorry. Oh, I'd say I'd I'd actually say the big I'd actually say the big culprits are. Um... Are oddly oddly enough seven and eight. No monk. Cat no. Okay. Casting an eight is not a thing you do. <laughs> Let's be honest here. You don't cast your magic, you equip it, and that's all you do. But seven? Yeah. Actually, I can see with seven that it did become very magic reliant in most places. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, I think it's very telling that both um, Crisis Core and the remake have gone to great lengths to drift away from that. Avoid it pretty well, I think. Um, I think Dra I think Dragon Quest has also had its mo has also had its moments of being very ca of being very caster f favoritism late game oh i think that's been a thing since dragon quest one and wasn't really resolved until probably seven and um i can definitely i can definitely s i'd say i'd say it's also a bit of the case with sui Koden. um so yeah i can see that um to an ex to an extent i mean it tries to justify it by by the fact that it, that it's using the spell charges even though it calls it MP it really isn't it's the it's the Vancian model no matter no matter how you put lipstick on that pig it's still a pig mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd say if the, I'd say if there's one if there's one console style RPG game that did not that did not become the caster show over the years Oddly enough, I'd say, I'd say it's the Tales and Star Ocean series. Yeah, absolutely. It could be argued that it's because everyone's a gish, but not re not really. In fa in fact, that in fact, um, when it comes to cat, when it comes to casters, it's it's so it's so divorced from the usual combat loop. You know, because of the, because of the charge time in a game that wants you to be very active. Even the initial tales of Fantasia had this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, but Monk, I think we've probably regaled our our uh, friendly audience enough with tales of good and bad caster design. Yeah. So with that, I I wanted to bring up all of that to kind of to kind of set the stage for how the how um. Our issue with casters over, over the years has a bit more nuance than one might expect. Yeah, and that there's a reason we find classes such as things like the Naturalist and Necromancer here in Vale of the Void so refreshing. Also, the mimic. Monk, let's be let's let's be fair. The mimic is just a is just a monk that knows how to magic more monks into existence. It's a ninja. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I will call it the ninja that it is. <laughs> Trevor, the mimic is a ninja, and you cannot convince me otherwise. I don't think he's gonna stop you. Good. By the Smart way, man. by the way, folks, use code Two Monks to get ten percent off Veil of the Void. As always, we uh, greatly appreciate that uh, Trevor has commemorated us as a discount code for his game. <laughs> but opening up, opening up the Thaumatech. 
While most have only felt the weak magic of this realm, the Thalmatech taps directly into the Arcane Realm. Through their advancements of binding technology to the Arcane Current, they have discovered how potent this realm can be. Practitioners of this magic have crafted an Arcanatech USB. Each USB is infused with an arcane crystal, either of fire, earth, water, or air. To cast a spell, the Thaumatech must have the matching USB in hand. These USBs need a, need a receptacle to operate, another creative technology developed by Thaumatechs. I'm calling, I'm calling them Gaia Memories and you can't stop me! I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> Each Thaumatech crafts an item or weapon by blending advanced technology with either a charged order or light crystal. Focusing on the item binds it with their arcane current. The item is enchanted, granting it control of more potent magic. Binding comes with a cost, however. Their connection weakens. Without this item or weapon, Thaumatechs can only cast the most basic magic. This leaves them vulnerable if they lose their Arcanatech item. Due to their casting styles, many Arcanters refer to them as enchanters more than mages. Oh, I have to wonder if that them was supposed to be themselves. Minor typo on that front. But they... So first no, we... no, no. They're saying Arcanters, because Arcanters is anyone who can cast magic. Mm -hmm. So, your Mechromancers, your Naturalists, all uh, your, your Mimics, everybody else. Yeah. Um, this is saying that other Arcanters outside of the Thaumatech tend to call Thaumatechs Enchanters more than Mages. Mm -hmm. So, f first we have Starting Proficiencies. For weapons, staffs, wands, and archaic weapons, light armor, and an arcane USB and an arcane emblem. Um, I hope that emblem isn't made of fire. Yeah, that was... Why not? The, fi the fire emblem's a shield, monk. <laughs> anyway... Upon each level up, add 1d6 or 3 plus vitality to your max HP. Then we have starting items. A Staff of Arcane, a Synthetic Light Robe, 5d6 times 1,000 system credits, 1 bonus level in crafting, and 1 bonus level in arcanting, and arcane USBs. I was tempted to go with either Gaia Memories or the Gaia Memory and all but name thing that Ultraman Trigger has. I think Gaia Memories is going to be more recognized. Mm -hmm. So, starting at level 1, you gain spellcasting as an exclusive. Your primary spellcasting virtue is mentality. You can use the unique spells from the Arcane Tree. You know six Nava spells and three Mystic spells at character creation. And this is a good time to point out that every even level, you're going to be getting a new spell. Yep. So at the start, you, ha at the start you have six Nava spells and three Mystic spells. So that's nine spells right out of the gate. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16... 20 16, divided by 2 is plus 10, monk. Yep. So, tw so 29 spells by 20th level. Have, have fun managing that on your character sheet. You mean 19 spells by yeah, 20th 19. level, at the, very, at the very least. But mm -hmm. there could be additionals from the spell upgrade, because there almost always are. Yeah. Uh, you also gain Elemental Master, which is exclusive. Every long rest, you may cast three Arcane spells before adding any points to your Arcane Charge state. Does this count for the Arcane Superlatives? I'd like... I don't think it does. <laughs> I'd like to know if this counts for the Arcane Superlatives. Because if it does, imagine casting a Superlative and it doesn't give you a charge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh. So you also gain Arcana Tech Enchantment, which is exclusive. Choose up to three items or weapons you started with to turn into Arcana Techs, known as Mag Magiductors. You can enchant an additional item slash weapon every f at levels 5, 10, and 15. If you so enchant... by, by, by 15, you'll have six of them. Mm -hmm. If you enchant more than your max items, your oldest is unenchanted. While holding your Magiductor item or weapon, you gain plus one bonus die during our canting checks. If your Magiductor is destroyed or inaccessible, you can only cast no novice spells. And this, so this is what they were talking about, that if you lose your, your arcane focus that allows you to use these arcane channels, you uh, can only cast at the lowest basic spells. Mm -hmm. However, <clears throat> even then, we've, we've seen in the novice spells and other trees that they're not anything to sneeze at. Pretty much. You also gain, as the fi as the final first level ability, elemental USBs, which is exclusive. You have access to the fire, earth, water, and arcana tech USBs at character creation. These advanced tech items give the caster direct access to the arcane current. While a USB is inside a magiductor, the user gains access to all spells in the linked tree accessible by their current spell level. For example, a novice level Thaumatech with a fire USB gains access to all novice level fire spells. At level 5, they gain access to both novice and apprentice level spells. Switching to a water USB then grants all spells within the water tree but removes the fire. It takes a full movement to change the USB type. If the USBs break, you can recraft, that, recraft using order or light crystals during a long rest. If the USBs are lost but intact, you may attempt a problematic 7 or canting check during a long rest to resummon them. <laughs> so question. When you say the USB grants access to all spells of that level, <clears throat> it just means all the spells of that level in that tree that the novice or the apprentice, etc. knows. Not to all of them in the tree, period. Because if that's the case, then the number of spells known would be yes, a little superlative. Yeah. At se anyway, at second level, you gain programmed elements, which is exclusive. While a USB is active, you have you gain access to additional programs based on the element. You may use three of these programs per short rest, and all programs have a shared cooldown of four rounds. These programs gain additional effects at levels 5, 10, and 15, uses an extra action to activate. The fire program, call forth a strand from the sun, dealing 1, 2, 3, or 4, or 4d6, plus mentality fire damage instantly. Water program summons a healing mist. All allies within 3, 4, 5, or 6 squares of you heal 10, 15, 20, or 30 damage. A earth program, wrap yourself in earthen armor, granting you resistance to physical and force damage. If you are hit by an attack, the target is hit by an earthen spike, dealing 5, 10, 15, or 20 earth damage. Triggers once per round, lasts 2 rounds. And air program, unleash a great tornado in a 5x5 five five square up to 8, 9, 10, or 11 squares from you. All beings in the tornado must perform a contested arcanting muscle balance check. On failure, they are sucked into the center and take 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 mentality air damage. <laughs> And at second level, you gain an extra skill point. As you do at every even level. Mm -hmm. So not o not only do you have a shit ton of spe a shit ton of spells, but you also have a you also have a elemental gimmick. 
Yep. Evolving Gaia memory powers. Mm -hmm. At third level, you gain Arcane, Rev Arcane Reverence, our first non-exclusive. The Arcane Realm floods your mind and embraces your thoughts. Draw up, draw on the Arcane Realm, re recharging your effective power pool. Once per long rest, you may focus on the Arcane Charge state and reduce it by six points. <laughs> Which that gives will you more uh, opportunity to safely cast. Yeah, because reducing it by six points, no matter what, is going to reduce you below that that uh, threshold at six. Mm -hmm. At fourth level, you gain advancement training. At fifth level, you gain spell upgrade. You may cast your spells at apprentice level and gain two additional spells. So now we're at twenty-one spells mm -hmm. by level twenty. Yep, you also gain your first ability from from your specialization. And only one of them is an exclusive. <laughs> At 6th level, you gain Reserved Arcane. You can store power within your Magic Conductor to use later. Choose one known spell of your current spell level, and at the end of a short rest, to store for later. Once per short rest, that spell can be cast by anyone with the Magic Conductor as an extra action without adding a level to their charge state. Meaning you could hand over the char th this Magic Conductor to, an to another caster. Which, imagine if, you're, if, the magic condu if the Magic Conductor you utilized was... Let's go, let's go with a rifle, and you give it to the soldier. Not only is he going to shoot things with that rifle really good, but he's going to uh, he's going to have a spell he can pop out whenever he wants, mm -hmm. it, so long as he has some arcanting. And as we've stated in the past, it's relatively easy to get arcanting. I mean, you can get arcanting on a, on a soldier really easily with an expertise, and there's even one of the core that's designed for being a caster. So at 7th level, you gain Advancement Training. At 8th eight, at level, you gain Solar Grenades, which is a non-exclusive. When you use a grenade, you may inscribe a rune on it, increasing its area of effect by 1. It inflicts an additional 1d6 elemental damage and seeks out up to 2 additional targets within 4 squares from the edge of the area field, inflicting half damage. So it's a frag grenade on crack. Got it. Oh. Jeez, that's a... Now you, end up, now you end up making me think of a, a literal frag and crack grenade combined. <laughs> <laughs> because fuck you and fuck your defenses. And fuck everyone within half, half, a, 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 half a kilometer of you. That's something that Cyrus would use. <laughs> just go, just go into, just go into stealth because somebody who knows what they're doing with Cyrus can have infinite stealth, and just throw, and just throw grenade, and just throw grenades all the time. Yep, grenade spam. Mm -hmm. oh, you also gain arcane understanding after focusing on an item for at least five minutes. Your connection to the arcane realm allows you to determine what elements comprise the item, as well as if arcane energy runs through it. So, good old detect magic. And that's also a non-exclusive. At ninth mm -hmm. level, you gain arcane gatekeeper, which is non-exclusive. After channeling for at least five rounds, you may open a portal into the arcane realm that lasts up to two hours. All who enter the arcane realm through this portal are protected from the harsh environment for the duration. You may move the portal while in the realm and open it back into the central realm. Three hour cooldown. You know, that's super useful. Like, super useful. Mm -hmm. 
see. At 10th level, you gain your next specialization ability, and you gain spell upgrade. So you can now cast your spells at a depth level, and you gain two additional spells. So now 23 spells by level 20. Mm-hmm. At 11th level, you gain advancement training. At 12th level, you gain arcane infusion, which is a non-exclusive. Infuse equipment with an element of your choice. These effects last three rounds and have a three-round cooldown. For air, if you'd put it on armor, you increase movement speed by two squares. I'll give that to the field knight for some fun. <laughs> um, or put, or you can put armor pierce on weapons. Give that to a soldier. Mm-hmm. Earth, for armor, attackers gain an auto miss against you. Or Good for you, thanks. Or for weapons, gain plus two bonus dice when deflecting. So all in all, good for good for tankiness. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd expect that from Earth, though. Yep. For fire, putting it on armor. Armors take your men- attackers take your mentality and damage when hitting you. Or for weapons, inflict burning. And for water, for armor. Incoming healing increases by 5, and for weapons, outgoing healing increases by 5. Oh, this is this has Field Medic written all over it. For the weapon? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the, for, the, for the armor, I'd say that's also good for tankiness, because tanks are going to be taking a lot of damage. It's also good for the naturalist. Mm-hmm. At 13th level, you gain Overpowered Arcana Tech, which is exclusive. If you roll three fours when successfully casting a non-superlative spell with your USB, you may overcharge the spell. When overcharged, double the range, damage, healing, or area field of the spell. Oh, man. Imagine you're melting a boss. And you get this. Oh, overcharge, double damage. Go! At 14th level, you gain advancement training. At 15th level, you gain your next ability on specialization, and you gain spell upgrade again. You may now cast your spells at Magus level and learn two additional spells. So now 25 by level 20. Mm -hmm. At 16th level, you gain Arcane Virus. All adversaries within 10 squares of you become weak to your equipped elemental USB. If a target has resistance to the element, it is removed. If they have protection from it, it is reduced to resistance. (laughs) Once again, fuck you and fuck your defenses. At At 17th level, you gain advancement training. At 18th level, you gain Master of Your Domain, which is non-exclusive. You may store one spell, known or unknown, from a non-unique spell tree to cast at a depth level for free once per short rest. You may switch this spell once every short rest. That would be useful on any fucking caster. Mm -hmm. Which is probably why it's non-exclusive, because imagine giving that to the Mimic. (laughs) At 19th level, you gain Arcanatech Unleashed, which is, which is exclusive. All spells you cast matching the element of your current USB have an auto-hit die. Any spells targeting you that match your current USB roll with an auto-miss die. At 20th That's level, not fire. This is fire. At 20th level, you gain Spell Mastery. Gain access to the superlative spells from the Arcane Spell Tree. You also gain your final specialization ability and your ultimate, Master of the Elements. The elements obey your command. Add plus one to your mentality. This may bring you above nine. You may cast two spells of Magus level or below for free once per 24-hour period. All programs from your programmed elements ability have a two-round cooldown instead of four. Gain immunity to elemental damage that matches your current USB. Nice. 
Um, I still, I still think we should, the question that I still have in the back of my mind is, does affixing a USB grant you all the spells from that element at that, at I, that level? I don't think so. I, I really want that, that, uh, that, uh, clarification though. But then we move on to the specializations. The first being Elemental Duelist. Which one might think is a typo at first, but there's a method to the madness. Which is why I'm not going to be making any Yu-Gi-Oh jokes. Wrong duel, anyway. Mm -hmm. While focusing and channeling the Arcane Realm, you had an epiphany. Dual USBs. Elements are dangerous enough without attempting to combine them, but you devised a multi-USB port. Among other things, you discovered your USBs have greater potential together than when alone. We really are going into Common Rider Double! Yep. Up, all this time we were using the Lost Driver, now we're using the Double Driver. Yep, it is the Double Driver. So... You do gain an extra proficiency, one bonus level in dual wielding, as well as medium armor. But at the st you start out with Elemental Split. Using the powers of two USBs, grant access to new abilities. While these USBs are active, you gain access to both spell trees. You may switch out one USB using half movement. After six rounds... The USBs are forcefully ejected, and this ability cannot be used again for five rounds. You gain new combo programs that may be used once every two rounds as an extra action while Elemental Split is active. These unique programs improve at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20. <clears throat> um, wouldn't you be, since this is a specialization, wouldn't you be getting this at level 5 anyways? Yes. Anyway. So, first we have Fire and Water. Perform an Arcanting check against the target's armor. On a success, dash at a target within your mentality in squares with a flame sword, inflicting your weapon's damage and burning before jumping back to your original position and lobbing a glacier grenade at the target that explodes, dealing two times weapon damage in a 5x5 five five area field. Um, is that freezer burn? Um, no. It reminds me of, uh, the Red Mage from Final Fantasy XIV, actually. Going in, going back out, over and over again. Fire Air. Summon a fire tornado in a 5x5 five five area field within 2 times mentality range. All beings within that field perform a contested Arcanting check. On a failure, they take three times mentality fire damage and gain the burning condition. Lightning then bursts from the storm, striking all beings within four squares of the field's edge for an additional 10, 15, 20, or 30 electrical damage and knocking them prone. This is a volcanic tornado. Mm -hmm. Something I want to clarify as well. When something is within four squares of the field's edge, is that only the external uh, edge of the field or the internal edge as well? Is that four squares, only four squares out from the edge of the 5x5 five five field? Or is it also four squares into the 5x5 five five field? I'm thinking it's outward, but that is a clarification that I think should be noted. Mm -hmm. um, fire and Earth... You wrap yourself in flaming arcane, arcane tech armor. Your armor level goes up to tough 5. All adversaries within a 7x7 seven seven area of you take mentality vir virtue in fire and earth damage every round. This program lasts 3 rounds. This is volcano armor. <laughs> yep. Uh oh. Water and Air. Summon a Water Scythe and choose a target within two times mentality range, then perform an Arcanting attack. On a success, inflict two times mentality and water damage. 
The blade flies towards one, two, three, four additional adversaries within mentality squares from the original target. Perform an arcanting attack against each, inflicting two times mentality in air damage. It's blade beam. Blade beam. It's the unholy combination of blade beam and chain lightning. The next is Water and Earth. Summon a Great Earth Blade in a chosen square up to 5, 10, 15, or 20 squares away. All beings within a 5x5 five five radius of the chosen square perform a contested or canting dodge check. On a failure, they take 2 times mentality in Earth and Water damage. The blade lasts for 3 rounds or 4 attacks, whichever is first, and may be used by anyone. This weapon inflicts two times vitality plus f times v vitality plus five earth damage. On each successful hit, the weapon freezes and shatters outwards in a four-square cone, inflicting vitality in frigid damage to all beings within that cone. It w by uh all accounts, it was nothing more than a hulking mass of earth magic. <laughs> Um, so you summon a sword, and summoning the sword hurts people, and then the sword can just be picked up by anyone willy-nilly to hurt more people. Mm -hmm. Give it to the soldier. Well, don't summon it near the soldier, though, unless he's, you know, able to dodge it real good mm -hmm. first. And then he could pick it up. Yep. And lastly is air and earth. Use your whole movement and an action to launch a large met metallic boulder in a straight line up to one, two, three, four times mentality in squares. All beings in that line take two times mentality in air damage and must perform a contested arcanting balance dodge check. If they fail, they are carried with the boulder until it stops, taking an additional 10, 15, 20, or 25 earth damage. <laughs> well, actually, this is more akin to the um, to the combination of the Fire Mace and Tome of Power in Heretic. Except it's actually useful. I actually think that this is more akin to a Mass Driver. Large metallic boulder, very fast, very far. It's just not done with lightning. It's done with air. Yep. At 10th level, you gain Defensive Arcane. You may perform a contested arcanting check against all single-targeted spells that target you. If you succeed at denying the spell, you may last launch a blast of dual arcane energy at the caster. This blast inflicts three times mentality in your USB's elemental damage. Three-round cooldown. Nice. Deny the spell, eat its energy, and shoot it back as dual energy. Mm -hmm. At 15th level, you gain dual caster. Gain an additional arcanting action. And while dual wielding weapons, add plus one pip during arcanting checks, and gain the expertise war canting. Nice. Which, <clears throat> you dig up what war canting is for the purposes of this. Sure, hold on. We'll end up getting to it when we get to when we get to expertise, but I want I want to have it in front of us for the for the purposes of showing what the fuck you're getting with this thing. War canting. Through years of training, you have come to understand how to cast spells, even with multiple weapons equipped. You can now dual wield and cast spells. You may use your arcanting skill to perform the deflect reaction against an incoming melee attack. So the reason that you need War Cantor for dual wielding is because, remember, they have to have an open hand. Mm -hmm. Now you don't. Yep. And at 20th, you gain War Cantor. While dual wielding weapons add 1d6 damage and plus 1 duration, round duration to your spells, you and your allies are no longer affected by your negative, non-superlative area field spell effects and damage. That's, uh... 
That's pretty nice. This is a fucking red mage. I told you. Next we have <sighs> the runesmith. Many in this age forget the old ways of magic. Most casting now is done through quick runes and movements. But the true power of the arcane lies in the old runic casting. The runesmith focuses on inscribing spells into a special bullet that fills their unique arcane six-shot revolver. They can also forge spell scrolls and enchant armors with spells. Percy, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> so, first we have runic casting, which is, ex which is exclusive. In and out of combat, you may perform runic casting. While performing runic casting, spells take two rounds, two minutes, of channeling per spell level to cast. After the channeling stages, automatically succeed the spell and double the effects of the spell. This does not add a stage to the charge state. Wait, what? This is what you get at level five? Yes. What?! Sure, you're taking a little time. Okay, I get it. But the spell automatically succeeds with double effect, and it doesn't add stages to your charge state. What? <laughs> That's awesome. The non-exclusive that you get is the old six-shot. You gain access to a unique arcane six-shot revolver. This revolver deals 2d6 physical damage, has a 1520 range, holds a clip of six caliber bullets, and uses so, arcanti to attack. I do want to say that's not the size of the caliber. By caliber, it means a physical ballistic bullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> During a long rest, you may inscribe a rune that holds a single spell on each bullet. These spells are free spells. Their range is replaced with the range of the revolver, and difficulty replaced with an arcanting attack. This gun, when loaded with spell bullets, may only be fired once per turn and is not affected by items, abilities, or skills that grant you an additional attack. You may only inscribe spells of the highest level you know, or of spell scrolls you have, onto the bullets and parchments in later levels. A superlative spell may not be inscribed. Aww... Yeah, the superlative spell combined with runic casting might get a little ridiculous. Just a little. Just make it break the gun. <laughs> oh. At 10th level, you gain runic scroll crafting. You gain access to the runic scroll crafting. You may focus for three hours to inscribe a spell onto parchment. During this time, you must perform a hard four arcanting and crafting check. If you fail, you add plus two hours to the crafting. Upon completion, the parchment becomes a spell scroll anyone can use. Yep. There's a way to get and even people without arcanting to, uh, to, to use spells. Mm -hmm. At 15th level, you gain rune-scribed armor. During a long rest... You may inscribe two sets of armor with an identical rune of barricade. Whenever a user with this rune is hit, reduce the damage by your mentality level and inflict two times mentality in damage to the attacker. This effect may proc twice on the same armor before expiring. So essentially, uh, it doesn't even have to be armor you're going to wear, and it's going to use your mentality stat, not the mentality stat of the person wearing the armor. Mm -hmm. Very nice. You also gain Archaic Power, which is an exclusive. When performing Runic Casting, you take one less round of channeling per spell level and double the duration of a spell. Wait, it's already just two rounds. Um, when you say one less round of channeling per spell level... Uh... Does that mean after novice, it's just one round of channeling? Since novice is the base spell level? Well, runa casting is two rounds per spell level. 
Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So, but, but even then, that's still... You're cutting them all in half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. And at 20th level, you gain Spell Slinging. You gain an additional action with which to use your all six shot ability, and you upgrade your revolver to have eight slots. Yep. So your revolver is now all is no longer all six shot; it's all eight shot. Mm -hmm. And you get two times to use it per round. Is this what would happen if you t if you took the red qu if you took the blue rose and turned it into a and turned it into an eight shooter. No, because you're still shooting two bullets at once with that one. So what do we have? It do we have something like Cerberus just with two just with two heads? <laughs> uh. Uh. I think it's just going to be an eight, uh, an eight chamber revolver. There have been eight chamber revolvers, mm -hmm. been twelve chamber revolvers. I'm pretty sure if I dig enough, I'll find a video about it from our favorite Gun Jesus. I think you did a video on the volcano revolver, but that is neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. Now our third specialization is Shade Caller. Shade callers are thalmatechs that specialize in concealing magic from the shadow realm. I was fucking kidding about the Yu-Gi-Oh jokes. They wrap the stealth effects around their spells and attacks, hiding their presence. They effortlessly walk and teleport between shadows. You gain daggers and death blades as extra proficiencies and one bonus level in covert. So you start out with Walk in Shadows. While you are hidden from adversaries, you may wrap yourselves in the tendrils of the Shadow Realm. While not within view of an adversary or while within a dimly lit area, you may automatically convert with four hits. Covert with four you hits. You may automatically month. covert with four hits. While in covert, you gain access to the active abilities listed below. You always have access to the passive abilities. And these abilities are Shade Blast, which is active. Strike a target from the shadows. As an extra action, you may cast a known novice spell at the target. If this spell hits, inflict double damage or increase the duration by two rounds. This reveals you for two rounds. Shade Strike. As an extra action, you may attempt to attack a target with a melee weapon. You gain an auto-hit die on this attack and inflict double damage. This reveals you for two rounds. Shift through the dark. Passive. Gain plus four squares of movement while in a dimly lit or darker area or while hidden. You may teleport between dark areas that are within your max movement range and that you have clear vision on. It's Shade Step. Mm-hmm. Eyes of the Star Fell, passive. While in darkness, you can see as if it was illuminated. Eyes of the Shar Fell. Mm -hmm. And D Dance of Shadows, passive. While you are hidden in darkness, you make no noise while when wa when walking. While wrapped in the tendrils of the Shadow Realm, adversaries roll with a auto-miss die on observation checks against you. At 10th, le at 10th level, you gain Hidden Caster. You, may, you now manipulate the Shadow Realm as you cast. Once every four rounds after successfully casting a spell, you may use your extra action to automatically covert with four hits. If you successfully cast a spell while locked in combat, you may use your extra action to disengage. You also gain Feast of Shadows. You are now sustained by the essence of the Shadow Realm. You no longer require sleep and need sustenance only once per week. Your spells inflict shadow damage alongside their standard damage. Ooh, fun. At 15th level, you gain Spell Thief. 
You may choose an enemy caster and perform a contested or canting check against them. If you succeed, you steal one of their spells and may use it for the rest of combat. If you fail, nothing happens. This may only be successfully attempted on the same caster once per day. Now the question here is, is the thievery random? Or do you get to choose which one of their spells to steal? I'm thinking it's the latter. But this may be Yo, a GM's call kind of thing. Yeah, I'd want some clarification there because it doesn't really indicate one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And lastly, you gain Master of the Shade, which is an exclusive. You gain the expertise Spellblade and are no longer revealed by light while wrapped in Shadow Realm Tendrils. You also gain two additional Walk in Shadows abilities. Tendrils of Penumbra, which is active, you may add one to your Arcane Charge state to cast this spell as an action. This spell has a three-round cooldown and casts with plus one auto-hit die. You force all adversaries within your max movement range to perform a contested or canting check. On a failure, they take 30 damage and are grasped by Shadow Tendrils for two rounds. Wow. And Cloak of Darkness, which is passive. The Shade Blast and Strike no longer reveal you for two rounds. You may attempt a challenging six covert check to hide in the shadows after the, att after the attack succeeds. And as for the expertise Spellblade, you can choose one novice slash mystic non-area field spell per day to inscribe on your melee weapon. After making a successful attack, you may cast the spell automatically. This raises your charge state. This spell may be used three times per day. At level five, you can use an you can choose an apprentice spell. <clears throat> Which also means that a, a um, expertise like Spellblade that's that makes it so that it so that as we've said before, being a Gish in Veil of the Void is stupid easy. Stupid easy and stupid fun. Also, as far as as far as the all or not thing, I looked at I looked at the el I looked at the element spells. There's not a whole lot per each level, so it might be all. That's <clears throat> that's true. I'd still, I mean, I'd still want uh, clarification though. I want I want the the actual, um, you know, from the creator's mouth. Yeah. <clears throat> of course, it, of, but I'd say um, if I'm reminded, if there's anything that I'm reminded of, oddly enough, it's the elementalist class in Guild Wars, especially how it's portrayed in Guild Wars Two, mm -hmm. where the four where the four elements are treated as stances. Yeah. And granted, of, granted, of course, in in Guild Wars, your choice of equipment is what is what's going to determine what attacks you're able to utilize, and that apply and that applies just as much to the Elementalist as as much as it does with any other class in that game. Mm -hmm. But what I do what I do find very interesting is that. This is definitely the wizard of of the group, but it's more of an elementalist than what people would think of as a for a wizard. I can't even go with the blaster caster analogy because that that doesn't quite fit. I think um your joke earlier fits best. Ashta Avatar. Yeah. It de it def it definitely is, especially especially since we're dealing with the whole Hellenistic elements thing. I'd say if there's any if there's any um, specialization that really fits that, it's the, it's all the dual element bullshit. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But you know how we love stance dance mechanics and 
to the point where we're using it in our own project. Yep. I definitely get that vibe with the uh, with the Thaumatech here. But even with that, I like the I like that the enchanting effects that they do have, which in a lot of other games, the idea of doing elementalism and enchanting would be two completely different fields that you'd have to pick one or the other. But they have a means to still support their allies instead instead of just being the caster, sh the I ca instead of being the I cast the elements show. Yeah, I'd say the I'd say the. The combination that would be that would be the most um that would be the biggest mix of supporting allies while casting would probably be the root would probably be a Thalmatech runesmith. That would be a very interesting uh that would be really interesting to play around with. Espe especially especially since runic casting means that they'll be even though they'll be taking the slow route for a bit of time, they'll be getting the most ca they'll be getting the most safe casting out of anybody, and this is already a class that has the most safe casting out of any of the classes that use magic. Mm -hmm. And you have the combination of your first three spells don't add to charge state, and you can do an emergency reset for charge state once per day. Even if you aren't taking the long rest for your charge state to go down like normal. Mm -hmm. You can do it in between rests, which is really nice. I'd say it's a really good way to keep pe to um, keep people from falling into the 99 Mega Elixirs trap. Yep, the too good to use club. The Shade Caller, I th I'd, I'd find, I'd find, pr I'd, I find plenty interesting. Especially since... A mimic that dips into shade color would be very amusing to me. <laughs> we already made that. We already made the <clears throat> canon that the mimic is a ninja, so why not go one step further? For a reference to a new video game, the shade color reminds me of the Black Knife Assassins. Mm -hmm. And the idea of st the idea of stealth casters is something that's been dipped into in plen in plenty of games but the problem yeah. is a in a lot of cases well the stealth system in those games kind of sucks mhm mm like whenever whenever somebody wanted to fin finagle with sneaking during combat trying to effectively sneak in combat was always difficult Yep, but we see it being done here, and we saw it done over in Heavens and Heresies. Pretty well, in both cases, too. A lot of times due to them not overthinking it. Yep, just do the thing. Do the thing, you're, you're in stealth, people have a harder time seeing you, you do something aggressive, you're out of stealth. I know some people might see that as a bit video gamey, but I do think that... And we've, st we've stated this in the past... I think a lot of people in t in in tabletop really need to get the stick out of their ass regarding so regarding something being adjacent to video games. They need to get the stick out of their ass about the quote unquote increased gamification. It's a fucking game. What do you expect? And as I've stated in the past, video games and tabletop <laughs> games have a closer relationship than they're given credit for. Yep. And I know some people might say, "Well, of course, of course, one come from one came from the other." That's true, but it's it isn't a it's when I say it when I say a close relationship, I'm saying it goes back all the way to the seventies. Just look up the just look up D and D on the Plato on the Plato servers. <laughs> That's how far back this goes. Or if yeah. I, or if I need to use something a little bit more contem contemporaneous, um, the SSI computer games, mm -hmm. several of which I th I'm pretty actually I'm pretty sure the majority of them you can get on GOG right now. I think so as well. And but this is only the the first half of the Thaumatech. Yes, 
Next week, we will be tackling the Arcane Realm spells. Largely because there's... Well, there's four elements that we have to cover, and although there aren't as... Although each element doesn't have as many spells as, say, as, say the spell list for the Mimic or the Naturalist, there's no way that we could have done... As I said before, there's no way we could have done both in one shot. Yeah. So next week we will be tackling the spell list for the for it as well as tackling the superlative spells for the, for, the, <laughs> for this thing and well, <laughs> super, superlative spells are always an interesting time. They're the funnest of fun times, monk. Just remember folks, violence is not the answer. It's the question. And the answer is yes. Indeed. But with that said, that will that will wrap th that will wrap things up for this particular episode of Valley of the Judged. Next week we'll be di we'll be dipping into the elemental spells, and if anybody makes a Captain Planet joke, I will hunt you. I know he's staring at me, people. I can feel his eyes. Oh, you're believe me, you're not the only one I'm staring at. Yeah, but I'm the one that you do this show with, so I know that I'm the first one you're staring at. <laughs> I also know you're not dumb enough to do a Captain Planet joke. Unless it's ro oh. unless it's the robot chicken rendition of Captain Planet. That'll let pass. Or the college humor Don Cheadle. Captain Planet. I'll, I'll, I love that one. Yeah. But, uh, it, Monk, I can't do a Captain Planet joke with this anyway. It's not called wind, it's called air. Fair point. But with that said, we will see you back. We will see you back here next week for the last of a very stellar lineup of classes. So until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!